part four, steps to the life of responsibilities. Chapter eight, marriage to a young baron. Marriage is a predetermined fate for a Japanese girl. There are parents who betroth their children before they are born. Some babies are engaged as soon as they take their first breath in this world. Within this social scheme, some girls grow beautifully. Others peep out like white plum blossoms buried under the snow of winter, nobly but painfully accepting their lot without any hope of joy. It is an unwritten code that a Japanese woman shall have only one man in marriage in her lifetime. Should she be left a widow when young, it is her duty to burn incense before her husband's spiritual presence in the family shrine and before his gravestone until the 49th day, <clears throat> and after that, once a month. Also, she is supposed to look after her husband's left token, that is, their children, as her only happiness, never caring for any other thing throughout her remaining years. To break the marriage tie on her own initiative is unthinkable for any well-bred Japanese woman. To have it broken by her husband is a tragedy. The grief of a broken mirror completely overshadows a divorced woman's life, and she and her family have to accept the cold scorn of society. A girl is taught to submerge herself in her husband's family, accepting her husband's ways, with absolute willingness, but the husband and his family can divorce her for any simple reason. This woman does not meet the way of my family, is sufficient to get rid of her. Consequently, a divorce certificate is often called the three and a half line note. So short and simple is it. Feudal Japan made harsh discriminations between the classes and the sexes, and even murders were justified when the samurai considered an action or a mark insulting to their dignity. Today, Japanese law solemnly declares that man and woman, high and low, rich and poor, are equal in its eyes. Human life and rights are strictly protected by its authority, since the great Mikado <clears throat> of the Meiji era inaugurated a new culture. But when we come to the matter of customs rather than statutes, woman is still kept in an inferior position. What parents would find satisfaction in leading their daughters to a sacred wedding carriage if they thought they were to be treated like children or insane people. My mother did not realize that her dignity was cheated by the discrepancy between our book of civil law and our practices in private, nor did I ever in my youth think for a minute that a definite line divided a woman's rights before and after her marriage, but I discovered in time that she marries to lose her privileges as a person. She can divorce her husband only when he has left her alone with ill intent and without economic support, whereas the husband can divorce his wife if he so much as suspects she has insulted him or his honorable elders. Usually divorce cases are not brought to the courts, but quietly accepted by the weaker sex, with a little promised alimony which she may or may not 
be able to collect without bothering their heads over the legal side of marriage. Girls and boys grow up and wed according to the law of Izumo God, the God who makes the sex matches for the Yamato race. It is only a recent phenomenon that we have so-called old maids as a byproduct of the higher education of girls. Having no historic term to cover this case, the Japanese had to coin a new English term, Old Miss, <clears throat> which is now widely used to mean the unmarried woman of, say, over 25. Nor did Japanese men experience bachelorhood <clears throat> until Western industrialism brought a high cost of living to this island empire, delaying matrimony. On a bright spring day in my 17th year, I had finished my morning duties in the house and was sitting alone on the silk cushion by the balcony window, looking down on the fresh young leaves of the weeping willow in the garden, whose slim green branches were swaying to and fro in the soft breeze. At such times, romantic sentiments, without any reason, occupy a young maiden's heart. Suddenly, the back screen slipped open, and a servant told me that I was called to my father's room. Cheerfully, as usual, I appeared in his presence. My mother was also there. I bowed lightly to them and asked, is there anything you would like me to do, Honorable Father? He replied, I have something to tell you, Shizu. Sit down, please. My father said this in an affectionate but solemn tone. I sat down on one of the big English chairs, feeling that something very important was at hand. You have finished your schooling now, he continued. So your mother and I are thinking about your future, wishing to make you happy by arranging a suitable marriage for you. The word marriage shocked me. A young girl brought up in the atmosphere of the old Confucian doctrine, <clears throat> which declares male and female children shall not be together after the age of seven, naturally held men in considerable awe. I was brought up with my brothers, of course, but I never thought of them as of a different sex. Now girlish shyness overcame me so that I could not raise my face. I sat with my head low and my eyes fixed on the edge of the turkey carpet. Father went on to say that a marriage was proposed by Baron Kikichi Ishimoto, the son of Baron and Lieutenant General Shinroku Ishimoto, whose services in the Mikado's army during the Russo-Japanese War had been rewarded with a title, many decorations, and great honors. Lieutenant General Ishimoto was dead. He had passed away two years before while in Prince Sayonji's cabinet as the Minister of War, the services for the third anniversary of his death had just been held by his widow and his six sons and daughter. The young Baron Ishimoto was now a student in the Imperial University of Tokyo and would finish the mining engineering course there in the coming summer. A position had been promised him by the Mitsui Mining Company, the largest of the kind in the country, and he was to enter upon his duties as soon as he graduated from the university. Dr. Wataru Watanabe, the head of the engineering department of the university, as well as certain close friends of my father, had given the most favorable recommendations for the young baron, 
as one of the brightest and most serious-minded students in the senior class. Father closed his exposition of the suitor's merits by saying, Think it over quietly, for your parents desire your happiness, but they are not forcing you against your will. I did not answer, but burst into tears, and covered my face with the long sleeves of my wisteria kimono. Do you hate to marry Shizu? Father inquired gently, patting my shaking shoulders. No, father, I... I just feel like crying. Father and mother did not seem quite to understand what caused their daughter to behave like this, for I was normally an exuberant child. They left me alone, and I continued to wet my kimono sleeves. A proposal by a young man of a prominent family did sound agreeable. But how could a young girl of seventeen, who had not quite outgrown her world of dreams, arrive at a decision on such an important matter in her life? One thing, however, was clear to my mind. An ambitious statesman was my ideal for a husband. I did not like the idea of marrying an engineer. Another anxiety was felt on account of my father's description of the baron's character. He sounded so serious that I feared he would be as upright and sober as a bronze Buddha. I preferred a character human, and even a little faulty. But these were not the reasons which led me to weep. My tears came from sweet regret at the dropping of curtains over my girlhood so soon. Girls like freedom to meditate and dream without obligations. To be confronted with such a responsibility just three weeks after my actual graduation from high school. Why not wait a year or two? Happy girlhood never comes back. That was my sorrow. On the same evening, Uncle Yusuke, who had just been married and had established a new home, was asked to come and talk about this family affair with me. Training in our home forbade children to contradict their parents in any matter, so we young people never discussed, never argued about things in their presence. But to talk to Uncle Yusuke was quite different. I could argue if I wanted to. I asked for his opinion about the problem of my marriage, trusting him to give a good judgment based on his liberal way of thinking. What a lucky child you are. You would be the most fortunate woman in Japan if you were to marry the young baron. I was quite amazed. Why is that, uncle? I asked. How could you see through my future like a prophet? My uncle did not hesitate, because he said, Baron Ishimoto is one of the brightest disciples of Dr. Nitob, and I have known him quite a while. Then he told me more about this young man, relieving my anxieties, and his eloquence persuaded me even to begin to like the Baron. Uncle Yusuke's explanation of why the young suitor had selected engineering for his profession moved me more than anything else. Although Baron Kaikichi Ishimosho was born in a family of wealth and honor, he was a humble student of Christian humanism. He was very gifted and was one of the students granted the privilege of studying without having to pay university dues. With his mother's consent, however, he always gave away his privilege to some other youth, 
whose family was in need of such consideration. As for his Christianity, it was not met with the same domestic sympathy, his parents considering the religion merely a foreign fad. This young man secretly attended Christian meetings to hear the gospel preached. One day he heard Colonel Gompe Yamamoto, the present Lieutenant General Yamamoto of the Salvation Army, talk on Christian soldiers. The Colonel's fiery words, be a cornerstone of society, impressed him strongly, and he made up his mind that he would not seek for fame or money, but be the man who supports the floor, to use the Japanese phrase. He wanted to be a social reformer and play the role of friend of laborers. Thus he chose to be a mining engineer, a profession which would keep him in close touch with the humblest kind of workers and their problems. He is not going to be a mere machine-like man, but a courageous soldier for his cause. Don't you think he is a wonderful young fellow, Shizu? Uncle Yasuki finished his long oration on the Baron. I had no idea about laborers, but Uncle Yasuki's remarks satisfied me. A day was set aside for the bride to be to see her bridegroom to be. Three black lacquered rickshaws carried father, mother, and me to the house of the go between, who had arranged for this marriage. It was a bright early May day, the sky was blue, and the breeze was soft. An hour's trip through and across the narrow crooked streets of Tokyo carried us to the Koshikawa district where Mr. Matsuda lived. When the tires of our rickshaw sounded on the gravel of the garden in front of the Matsuda mansion, Miss Matsuda came out to greet us. She told us that the other family was already there, waiting for us. As I entered this home, my eyes fell on a set of old Tosa screens representing against a background of dull gold, some court nobles at their banquet. These stood in the front room, all the sliding screens being open, soft voices could be heard from the inner room beyond. <laughs> I hesitated a moment as my heart beat a little faster. Somewhere a voice whispered, You are to see the very next minute the only man in your life. I do not know how my mother felt. She touched lightly my comb inlaid with lustrous mother of pearl and arranged my green obi sash embroidered with white peonies. Then I stepped into Mr. Matsuda's big 30 mat reception room with its vista of a thick wooded garden beyond and I found there three people sitting on heavy Chinese silk cushions, two elderly ladies and a handsome young man, tall and thin in the black and gold buttoned uniform worn by students of the Imperial University. It made him look young but dignified. Before we took our seats on the cushions by the tokonoma, we were introduced to each other formally by Mr. and Mrs. Matsuda, and polite bowing was exchanged many times. I am a humble girl, but I shall be glad if you recognize me hereafter, were the words I repeated with deep bows. The young baron was smiling as he talked to his mother. I cast many a shy glance at him, stealthily but critically, Neither of us talked much, but sat quietly, hearing what the elders had to say. 
Do I like him? Does he like me? I repeated in my mind while a grand dinner was being served on the big lacquer trays. It was a formal dinner with three trays for each person containing delicacies of the sea and the mountains in handsome lacquer bowls and Kyoto porcelain. But I could little enjoy this feast on account of my repeated silent queries. Do I like him? Does he like me? In time I found myself reassuring myself. Yes, my first impression of him is favorable, and I hope he is pleased with me. I do not know what other girls do and think on such an occasion. It is considered proper, even today, in Japan, for an honorable marriage to be arranged by this formal process. Some people are anxious to introduce the Western love match to our society, but they have not yet succeeded. Some young people think they have fallen in love at first sight, and others only develop mutual love and understanding after they marry. I still cannot give my opinion as to whether this arrangement by parents is a better custom and one to be preserved, or whether the Occidental love match should be encouraged. Marriage is destiny, after all. After this, seeing each other, prelude was over. Both sides were to give their answers to the middleman. Mine was yes, and my parents were relieved. So a family council was solemnly called, father being the head of the Hirota family. Of course, had the right to give the decision on an affair of this kind but it was customary to get the approval of other members of the family, and the great uncle, uncles, aunts, and cousins all agreed to this betrothal of the eldest daughter of the Hirota family to Baron Ishimoto. Mr. and Mrs. Matsuda brought the answer of the other side, equally positive and favorable. Thus we two young people were finally engaged. At the end of May, a lucky day was selected on the moon calendar and set for an announcement of the engagement. The exchange of betrothal presents was the principal ceremony for this day. At that time, custom still prescribed on the girl's side the gift of Cindy Hera, a stiff silk for a skirt to be worn by the man over his ceremonial kimono, but this has been widely displaced today by some woolen material for a man's western swallowtail coat. My gift of cloth was sent from my father to his prospective son-in-law and a wide piece of brocade for the bride's ceremonial obisash was presented according to the old rule by Baron Ishimoto to me. The seven materials for good luck which were to accompany the exchanging of the cloth and the Kyoto brocade were arranged on spotlessly clean wooden trays according to conventions. These comprised a pair of thick white paper fans, meaning more prosperity in the future. A bunch of dry seaweed, lamanara, called kombu, which in Japanese has the same sound as the word meaning childbearing, a bunch of fine white dry noodles, which from their resemblance to white hair symbolize the permanence of the marriage, and two other objects of similar significance. They were beautifully decorated with artificial pine branches, on which were fastened flying storks and mother storks in their nest, all made of silk. These pines and storks also symbolized 
long life, and prolific glory to the family. In addition, there was a tray holding a list of the names of the members of my future husband's family, including uncles, aunts, and cousins, sixty in all. The same was handed from my family to his, and hereafter both families were to be as relatives. The betrothal ceremony started early in the morning. A household manager of each family departed with presents for the other at the same hour in a rickshaw, and it was arranged that they should meet in the middle of the street, exchanging mutual congratulations from their carriages. Mr. Akakusa, a bald-headed man in a black silk ceremonial kimono embroidered with white family crest, arrived at our home from Baron Kikikichi Ishimoto's with the customary presents which were ceremoniously accepted by my father and arranged in front of the gold screen in our large white reception room. Father opened the spotless plain wooden box and took out a brocade, obi embroidered with pines and chrysanthemums in gorgeous colors. I was quite happy and thanked Mr. and Mrs. Matsuda, who visited both families by turn that day to congratulate everyone. A red rice, whole seafood, and bean feast was served at the family table. In the middle of the day, brothers, sisters, and all the servants came to say, Omedeto, to me, except my little brother Hiro, who said to me, I don't want to give my dear sister to anybody. I feel sorry to see my sister going away. A sweet and sad expression came over his face. He was nine years old at the time. Formal calls now had to be exchanged by both families. It was early June. The rainy season had not started yet. The sky was blue and trees were turning dark green. We received an invitation to dinner from the Ishimoto family and we were asked to arrive a little early in order to see the garden. Of course, I was thrilled to be taken to see, for the first time, my fiancé's residence. Baron Ishimoto's house, built in the old Kyoto Palace style, stood in the Kuishikawa district. The big square wooden gate had heavy swinging doors with iron fittings, and a roof covered with dark gray tiles. Soft gray gravel covered the drive beyond the gate, and tall ginkgo trees with their fan-shaped leaves stood on both sides like giant sentinels. In front of the entrance hall were camellia plants and dark brown Japanese maples. The house itself was divided into two wings, <clears throat> one Japanese and one foreign. It was fashionable among wealthy Japanese to build both Western and native quarters, although the Occidental copy is not always successful. First, we were led into the foreign wing, where the Baron and his mother, his aunt, and the rest of his family received us warmly. As my father and the baron, the heads of the two families, exchanged greetings, my father said, Inscrutable fate has connected both families. We are all humble people, but I am honored to present my daughter to you, that you may treat her with favor. The baron replied, We are humble people also, and inscrutable fate brought us here to accept your honorable daughter as a bride in our family. I was formally being given to Baron Ishimoto's family, 
The idea of giving a daughter to a family and not to a man is much more distinctly expressed in the case of the marriage of the eldest son than of a younger one. The eldest is regarded as a symbol of family pride, while younger sons are treated as persons less important to the family. I bowed and repeated the same words of humble greeting. Oh, how many times, perhaps ten times, as I was introduced to each of my five future brothers-in-law and one sister-in-law, and even to the head of the maids, who was over seventy-five years old and had served this family for more than thirty years. She bowed to me, folding her small body double, her formal Japanese coiled hair becoming especially conspicuous in the act. Then we moved slowly out to the garden. First, father's black shoes, mother's low and soft mat-covered polowinaya clogs, and my blue silk sandals beat a soft tread around the house from the front entrance to the big natural footstone leading down from the house. A servant in a blue-black silk coat announced that everything was ready in the garden. We took no initiative ourselves. That is not done in aristocratic circles. We waited to be ushered down the slope along the stone steps into the garden several acres in size at the foot of the slope on which the house stood. A hill covered with a chestnut forest formed the center of the garden. Through the woods ran a brook softly murmuring on its course towards an artificial lake at the foot of the hill. Narrow wooden or rotten bridges crossed the meandering stream. The water of the large pond was green and natural stones of various shapes and sizes were set all around its edges. Lotus, cowlilies, trees, and irises were blooming in rich profusion. A wisteria trellis built on the bank cast shadows from the purple flowers hanging in bunches some four or five feet long. In the shadows, bees were humming peacefully. The wide, gentle slope on the top of which stood the house and along which the garden path led down to the pond was entirely covered with azaleas in full blossom, peach, white, pink, lilac, orange, dark rose. There they clustered, and the splendid sight was inspiring. We took a brief rest in the grass-thatched arbor at one side of the spacious ground, sloping up to the hills of azaleas. My future mother-in-law was not happy until she had shown us all parts of the garden, even her flower and vegetable beds. I followed her everywhere. I was dressed then in a pale crepe kimono with a wide sash of silver texture embroidered with camellias, my sleeves hanging almost to the ground. The design on my kimono of some sweet china pink blooming by the water and painted on the silk was thoroughly approved. The baron's mother told me that she loved to see her daughter-in-law in beautiful kimonos as she had six sons and only one daughter of her own to delight her eyes in that way. I did not speak a word to my fiancé while we were walking in the garden, but was always careful to follow his mother closely. Finally, we were taken into the Cryptomeria woods, 
where a diminutive shrine to Inari, a popular fox god, set on top of some stone steps, was opened to the guest. Old, red paper lanterns were hung on both sides of the small altar, in the center of which a sacred bell was suspended, breaking the quietness of the woods when it was shaken by occasional worshippers. A formal dinner concluded this ceremony, when my rickshaw descended the hill as we were hurrying home, I heard frogs croaking in the dark swamp. I looked up at the sky and saw that stars were twinkling high above, and the evening breeze which toyed with my hair was cool upon my hot body and soul. I had learned nothing from this visit about the man I was to marry, but I knew his background. A formal return call took place a week later, the Ishimoto family being entertained by mine in the most elaborate western manner. French food was carefully prepared and served by stewards in full dress. Silver and porcelain brought back from Europe by my father graced the feast. My father in turn took our guests to every part of his castle-like home, equipped with modern conveniences. He even took them to his favorite retreat, the bar downstairs, where he kept old Scotch whiskies, French wines, and other Western liquors. He showed them how to play shuffleboard and other games in the basement but my fiancé's mother did not seem quite to understand the beauty of Western rooms in the Louis Quatorze style, or a chamber furnished with a North European stove. Unused to chairs, she must have found them ridiculous. My mother told me to play on the piano for my fiancé, and I selected a Beethoven composition. I had been trained to appreciate the conveniences and the accomplishments of the West as well as the arts of my native land, for my parents wanted me to be able to adjust myself to the ways of a husband, whatever they might be, and I had such facility in adapting myself to the Western manner of living that it was actually painful for me after I was married to go back to the pure Japanese house and live with an old mother-in-law in true native fashion. This she held too rigorously, however, and she was a woman of strong character. She had helped her husband win glory and wealth. She had brought up her seven children with strict discipline, and she had worked hard to keep her domestic affairs in order. She cooked well. She sewed swiftly. In later years, when she felt that she had done all that she should do as a good wife and wise mother, she had begun to devote more time to her own pleasure, such as writing 31 syllable poems and learning Ute, the singing part of the no play. She liked to have parties at home inviting her friends to see her azaleas or to hear the cuckoos in her garden. Often she went to see the no drama and to the kabuki theater, being a widow, complete mistress of her own home, and moreover the practical head of the family. She was at liberty to live her life as she pleased, and her choice was the traditional Japanese way. She had very little sympathy with objects or ideas that came out of the West. Westerners were to her red-haired barbarians. Her adherence to custom had prevented her sons visiting his fiance freely, for she thought it beneath his dignity to visit a woman often.
to talk over the telephone or to write to each other unnecessarily was in her mind a sort of promiscuous conduct in violation of her moral standard and not to be countenanced even after our engagement. She wanted to pound into her future daughter-in-law's brain the Confucian doctrine of female inferiority, whether in the East or in the West. However, nobody could ever succeed in building a fence between two people who love each other. Confucianism could not quite separate me from my betrothed. One day before we were married, my parents sent a note to Baron Ishimoto asking him to come to tea and supper as we were about to leave the city for a summer vacation and he also was going away to take up his new post in western Japan. I was excited from early morning until his arrival as I helped my mother arrange fresh flowers in the drawing room and dining room. My mother had told me what time my fiancé would appear. The bell rang exactly at the stated moment, and before the maid came to attend to the door, I had opened it instantly, for I had been waiting secretly nearby. Blushing, I slipped him quickly a long letter written in India ink on fine Japanese paper and wrapped in a pale blue silk fukusa. The smuggling of a love letter quite succeeded. His answer came in the same manner whenever he visited my family, but he had to invent all sorts of excuses in order to get his mother's permission to see me. In spite of the admonition of Confucianism, the sprout of affection grew smoothly, and after he left Tokyo for the mining field, we were allowed to write to each other freely. My stepping out for the last time from the school gate, under the falling petals of cherry blossoms, my being engaged under the rippling bunches of wisteria flowers and plans for my marriage in the snowy Christmas season kept my mother extremely busy. She lost weight conspicuously. Her devotion, her strength, her care seemed to be concentrated upon her eldest daughter during these days. It was the time for her to put a finishing touch on her maternity to teach her daughter to behave gracefully and nobly, not to be blamed as a young baroness and daughter-in-law to the widow of a great public man. My mother regretted that the opportunity for her to give final training and advice to her daughter was so limited. From morning till night, she paid particular attention to every action or remark of mine. She even came to my bed every night to see whether I behaved well while I was asleep. To sleep properly on the wooden pillow without ever letting the head fall from it is still a strict requirement for a daughter of a samurai. Another anxiety of my mother was to prepare a complete trousseau for the bride. My father was generous about the expense of furnishing a splendid outfit, befitting the baron's rank. In my trousseau, accordingly, there were two divisions. One had to do with furniture, including large chest for bedding and chest of drawers for kimonos, all made of old Polowinia wood, unpainted, but polished to show its natural grain. The other consisted of bedding and clothes. There were several sets of bedding to be used at different seasons, 
and on different occasions, such, for example, as for a wedding, for guests, and for ordinary use. Kimonos and obis were prepared for the four seasons, with appropriate underwear and wrappers, jewels, silver, and even paper of all kinds, and for different purposes, figured in my equipment. The whole heap of possessions was carried by four two-ton motor trucks to the Baron's mansion five days before our wedding. In later years, when I traveled in China and happened to attend a grand wedding in a wealthy family, I discovered that the Japanese trousseau was far more complicated than the Chinese. The tremendous masses of furniture and clothing were, of course, not planned with regard to the actual circumstances of married life, but to indicate the rank of the bridegroom's family, and especially to please the mother-in-law, who already had every essential and luxuries as well. My possessions could only double the beautiful but useless heaps of stuff in her own dwelling and serve as an added nuisance. The poor bride could not remember all she had brought to her husband's home and was overwhelmed by the task of trying to keep her things in order. But perhaps the trousseau gratified someone. It was exhibited to relatives and friends of the bride before it was carried to the bridegroom's house. There it was exhibited again to the husband's family and to his relatives and friends. The great amount of work connected with all this business almost killed the young bride. My mountainous trousseau was itemized to the smallest detail in catalog form, even including my high school diploma, which was presented by my father to my husband's family. This gesture meant that these objects were not the bride's personal possessions, but were to become the property of the groom's family, like the bride herself. I still keep the catalog, which I translate here. Of these heaps of things, most articles were made to order. Greatest care was taken with the ceremonial kimonos, thirty in number. First, my mother called the assistant from the ceremonial kimono department of the Mitsukashi shop, who had always come to our house to solicit orders. They talked over colors and designs so that each color and each design would symbolize the particular occasion on which a garment was to be worn and would never be repeated. The artist at the shop worked out the designs on white silk material, then the painting and embroidering department, after many careful experiments, carried out the schemes. Finally, the sewing department fashioned the cloth into flowing robes with red lining and they were sent to our house neatly folded in white paper boxes. For all this labor and for the exquisite materials used, the price for the embroidered wedding robe alone came to about 700 yen and each of the ceremonial kimonos with streaming sleeves cost from 300 yen to 500. For other kimonos, haroi coats and petticoat kimonos, my mother went to various silk shops to choose materials. To get 200 of them in half a year must have been a tremendous task. It was the same with the obis. The jewelry and silver 
were mostly ordered by my father from Mappin and Webb in London, and the hair ornaments of numerous carved and inlaid pens and combs, all representing happy figures, were ordered from the White Peony Company, the most select shop of the kind in Tokyo. The furniture, such as the chest of drawers, cabinets, bureaus, desks, and flower vase stands of Paloenia or chestnut had to be made to match one another. They had oxidized silver fittings bearing the family crest. The lacquer utensils also had to match in color, design, and shape. The entire cost of my trousseau must have been over 20,000 yen, which may seem an inexcusable sum to spend on a young girl's mere clothes and their accessories, but this was almost all I was to take to my husband's family, for a Japanese bride was not supposed to bring any money or real estate. If she needed to pocket money, she was obliged to sell her gorgeous clothes or ornaments. She had to keep her things carefully so that they might last all her life, for she could not hope to have any new clothes unless her husband or her mother-in-law happened to be interested in dressing her up in a style more modern than that of her wedding trousseau. Wedding presents, as the West knows them, hardly made up any part of my trousseau. As such, gifts in Japan are mostly limited to white and red silk cloth and dried katsu fish, porcelain, which is easily broken, tea things used for condolence presents, and handkerchiefs, the name of which sounds unlucky to Japanese ears, are strictly taboo on this occasion, but silk cloth was given in rolls of white and red decorated with artificial pine, bamboo, and plum branches, and storks and turtles. Sometimes these rolls were shaped into various lucky figures, such as the big Thai fish, rising sun, pine tree, or plum blossoms, all made out of one long piece of silk tied with silk thread and gold and silver strings. Since the gifts came from families and not from my personal friends, and were more symbolical than useful or amusing. There were comparatively few things I really could enjoy. December 23rd, 1914, was set for my wedding day. I got up at dawn for meditation. Then I wrote in my diary my last thought as a virgin and a member of the Hirota family. It was snowing softly outside, and I felt the snow was purifying me for my sacred day. After a light breakfast, the process of making up the bride began. First, at six o'clock, the hairdresser came with her assistant. My hair was coiled up in the Shimada fashion, the proper coiffure for a bride. After being oiled and perfumed until it looked like lustrous black satin, the double knot high in the center with big puffs all around made my face look small indeed and accentuated the line of the neck in approved style. Five pieces of light amber colored tortoise shell in exquisite carving decorated my hair. Beautiful Shizu-sama 
said Oko, a middle-aged maid who came to my family before I was born and was going to wait on me in my new home after I was married. <clears throat> it looks almost as if dew were dropping down from your hair, such watery luster, she repeated, but to me it felt heavy like an iron helmet of a samurai. I took a hot Japanese bath to steam the hair and also to make my skin ready for thick powdering and painting. Another professional woman made up my face, neck, and hands, etiquette demanding that a bride should be painted like an ivory image. A pure white habutai silk kimono with full-length sleeves that, <clears throat> that touch the floor. A white satin obi with flowers embroidered in gold and silver. A heavy white robe with phoenix and polowinia blossoms embroidered in gorgeous color to wear over the white silk kimono composed my wedding costume. This pure white ceremonial apparel the same in color that is worn at a funeral, signifies that a bride is a person dead to her family circle. I took the seat of honor for the farewell dinner. Among all the members of my family, it was a Japanese meal. Saki was served at the table and used to toast the family on the approaching marriage within its ranks. Solemnity governed the whole affair. Everybody kept utterly silent until my father spoke quietly and gently the words of farewell to his daughter. His final admonition, he said gravely, Father Bird and Mother Bird love to have their young birds with them forever, but when the young birds grow fully, they fledge out leaving their nest, and parent birds behind. This is the day for my beloved daughter, Shidzu, to use her own wings. She will meet bright sunshine under the blue sky as she flies, <clears throat> but some day her wings may have to fight with mean rain or cross wind. It is life as it is. Conduct yourself honorably, Shidzu, and be happy in your new nest. An 18-year-old bride accepted this admonition only with tears, unable to speak a word. My mother did not comment, but looked serious and pale in her black ceremonial robe. Everybody began to take up chopsticks and eat without speaking. Suddenly, Miss Matsuda, who with Mr. Matsuda had participated in earlier rites, began to weep. She even took her handkerchief from her sleeve and wept bitterly. How could I control myself from bursting into tears, too? I sobbed like a child. My mother said quietly to me that I had no time for crying today because the moment had come to depart. Yes, I must start now to leave my dear family and put my carefree girlhood behind me. Oko at once became energetic with her powder puff fixing the bride's makeup again and again. So easily was it spoiled by falling tears. Sisters, brothers, servants, and all the other people of the household stood in the front court as my carriage drove out from the gate, leaving two parallel gray tracks on the ground, which was covered with soft snowflakes. A sacred fire was lighted, and sacred salt was scattered round the front entrance of our house by Toku. The old gardener of the family, a rite which signifies, Thou 
shalt never come back again. I was saying to myself over and over, the marriage vow shall not be broken in any circumstances. I shall not go home, whatever the struggle I must face in the future. Have I to die in difficulties, I shall do so alone. The thought of such a filial break pressed heavily on my mind of the one who was leaving her family and upon the hearts of those who were sending her away. Bondage to the old family system tightened tenfold and even twicefold the ties of the young woman with her own kin. Even the passionate love of her husband was felt to be like moonlight on a cloudy night, to be covered up easily by the strong power of dark mischief. So the stern but pathetic determination of a Japanese bride often hides the happiness of a wedding day behind a storm of tears. The wedding itself was performed in the grand reception room of the Ishimoto residence and was conducted by Baron Yujiro Nakamura and his wife, who now took the place of Mr. and Mrs. Kosei Matsuda at the second go-between, the three, three and nine times exchanging sake cup ceremony united two souls, and I became the wife of Baron Kekichi Ishimoto. The sake cup used but once for the ceremony and broken immediately when it was over, was made of white clay according to the Shinto tradition. The sake was served by the conventional butterfly boy and butterfly girl, roles played by the little children of Mr. and Mrs. Matsuda. The ceremony ended in the Utai music rendered by Mr. Matsuda, a passage from the no play Takasago, based on the legend of an old couple turning into pine trees after having enjoyed a long life of mutual help and love. This is the proper close for every Japanese wedding, a most solemn ceremony in which everyone looks as grave as possible, was at last ended, to my great relief. The bride was then taken into her new dressing room, and her white robe changed into a long-sleeved cinnabar kimono. Thus the maiden, who had left her own home in a funeral shroud, was restored to life in her husband's family. The ceremony of uniting the parents and their new, bri their new begotten child and that of sanctioning the new sisterhood and the new brotherhood took place next. It likewise consisted of passing round the sake cup. The bridegroom was dressed in a black habutai silk ceremonial kimono with its five big white crest of Count Sakai, the former daimyo of the Ishimoto family. The robe having been honorably given by the late daimyo to Baron Ishimoto's grandfather. For this ritual, the newly married couple knelt side by side on cushions, like a prince and princess of the doll festival, their backs to the center of the tokonoma on which were hung a pair of kakamono of white storks painted by Kitsu Hogan, one of the great artists of the 18th century. An enormous branch of a moss-covered pine tree with a little bunch of white daisies entwining themselves around it was arranged before the kakamono, the pine signifying masculine beauty and glory, the sweet white flowers the womanly virtues of obedience and modesty. Then followed the couple's first eating ceremony, a meal pompously served on gold and lacquer trays according to the command of tradition, 
you shall eat together, but I could hardly touch the gay display of food. The wedding of a rich Japanese girl makes her a complete robe hanger. A professional dressing woman ran after me all day long, often changing my costume to harmonize with successive ceremonies. All the accessories had to be changed for each costume, and tying up the obi is necessary each time. A wonderful art, but an incessant torture to its victim. The bride had to endure this with patience and be careful not to faint, even when the long, thick textile being wound around her choked her very breath. My cinnabar robe was changed for a black streaming sleeved ceremonial kimono painted with white flying storks after I had received congratulations at a dinner prepared in western style. At this dinner there were nearly 300 guests relatives, and friends of the two families. My mother-in-law did not object to having this party given at an hotel because she knew that it was impossible to have one on such a scale in the Japanese manner without spending far more time and labor upon it. Nevertheless, some customary Japanese rites were observed and in the middle of the dinner, the bride left the hall to appear again in another handsome ceremonial kimono of celadon color embroidered and painted with a gay ox-drawn carriage covered with cherry blossoms. As the evening drew to a close, the bride and bridegroom were taken from the hotel to the bridegroom's home by the first go-between, leaving the guest behind, another and the last changing of costumes for the final ceremony of the day was made, a set of screens painted with gay flowers of every season surrounded the wedding bed, laid on the new green mat floor and covered with soft silk quilts. Miss Matsuda alone attended this last rite, entering the bridal bed and left us within the screen with the congratulation Omadeto Gozai Masu. Chapter 9 Life of a Bride in a Big Family System My bridal night was cut short by my maid Oko who waked me at five in the morning. It was dark and cold. I had to dress before my mother-in-law left her bed, and she had a habit of retiring late and of waking up early. It was the duty of a bride to please first her mother-in-law and serve her husband next. My mother-in-law did not treat me like a young girl as my parents did. She looked on me as a full-grown woman. Perhaps this was natural, since my husband was much older than I, and I had to correspond with his age. Besides, I had to behave with an elder sisterly dignity towards my brothers-in-law, some of whom were several years older than I. I took my first breakfast in the midst of the entire family. My mother-in-law and my husband sat on silk cushions, but I, with the rest of the family, sat directly on the mat without a cushion. I had three sets, one consisting of five pieces of cushions for the guests, and three pairs for my own use in my trousseau. Yet I had to sit on the cold mat, shivering, to show my humble attitude 
towards my elders. After the meal, my mother-in-law admitted that I was still too young to take on my shoulders the whole responsibility for the house, but she would show me the ways of the Ishimoto family, and I must learn them as quickly as possible. She did not lay down any definite rules or principles. She wanted me to learn by observation. She did not fail to remark, however, that I had to serve my husband with respect, as he was the head of the family since the death of his father. I must wait on him when he dressed, and bow to him when he went out, and again bow him at the entrance hall. When he returned, of course the same formalities were to be observed towards my mother-in-law herself. Every act of mine must be approved beforehand by these two. When I wished to go out of the house, I was to get their consent to leave. As for what I was to wear, I had to bring two or three kimonos and obis to my mother-in-law's room asking which kimono and obi it pleased her to have me don. My poor mother-in-law must have had great difficulty in selecting one kimono out of my hundreds. The task of being a mother-in-law is indeed never an easy one. She has to be a perfect example to her daughter-in-law. She cannot sit lazily in the presence of her son's wife. She has to refrain from spending too much time on her own pleasure because she admonishes the younger woman to think only of family interest. She must, in short, practice what she preaches. When my mother-in-law had company of her own, it was the duty of her obedient daughter-in-law to attend the guest and entertain them. The same code held in the case of a party for the husband, he being the master of the family. When there were to be guests in the house, preparations had to be started early. The decoration of the rooms was the most important part. After the maids had cleaned and dusted the reception quarters, my mother-in-law taught me how to place the ornaments and the painting scrolls on the above or on the ornamental shelves. My husband's family possessed more than a thousand scroll pictures, painted screens, <clears throat> and other antiques. All the work of well-known artists, which were carefully kept as the family treasures in the go-down. The Japanese regard the hanging of pictures to cover the whole space of a wall as poor taste. Decorations are changed according to the season or the occasion. They do not believe that beauty is achieved by rushing. It is a strenuous undertaking to carry long, heavy scrolls of painting and other ornaments with care from the go-down <clears throat> and to return those which had previously been on display. My mother-in-law asked me to alter the entire scheme of pictures and ornaments every week for every one of the eleven alcoved rooms. This meant arduous thought as well as labor, for sensitive judgment and a keen no knowledge of Japanese art were involved. However, I owe my mother-in-law much as she gave me a thorough training in our traditional art decoration. Eventually, she often trusted the entire choice <clears throat> of scrolls and other ornaments to me. 
she taught me, for instance, that I should not repeat any scene or object in my plan of decoration. To illustrate, one autumn, for a moon viewing party, I selected a set of maple blossom paintings and a pair of Japanese deer executed by the master hand of Corin, and let the silver moon cast its shadow on the green mat floor of the room, on the lacquered ornamental shelves with their design of dew-strewn autumn plants inlaid with mother of pearl, I placed an incense burner of clay pottery in the shape of an insect container. I hung a picture of a full moon on the Mushashino Valley at the alcove in the back room where the moon would not shine. My mother-in-law was very much pleased with the scheme and its effect. She felt that I had learned the art of decoration well enough to take my place as her understudy. There is no privacy in a Japanese house, for the rooms are not locked, and usually the sliding doors which separate the rooms are kept open even on cold winter days. So my husband and I behaved like strangers to each other while we lived in the midst of of watching eyes. It was a life in which individuality was completely killed in order to create harmony for the family. I have many friends who have married into big households who keep themselves busy night and day working for harmony in the husband's family. One of my friends lived in a separate house from her parents-in-law, but in the same compound. She visited them three times a day, so that her days were so filled up with visiting that she could do very little else. Another girl who was famous as a beauty in our class fixed her hair in the old-fashioned way after she married and wore homely old kimonos, which spoiled her charm. And this, she told me, was dictated by the taste of her mother-in-law. My next lesson after that of interior decoration was learning how to take care of the family shrine. Baya, the old family maid of 75 years, came to teach me this. The shrine represented a Buddhist temple in diminutive size with wood carving of exquisite workmanship. A little golden image of Buddha was set in the center and the mortuary tablet of my father-in-law and the other ancestral tablets were set on both sides of the red lacquered altar with its golden pillars. Baya showed me how to clean each of these precious things together with the entire altar using a tiny brush and soft cloth and how to arrange flowers in a pair of little brass vases in front of the altar. I loved to handle these tiny art objects. I felt as if I were playing at the doll festival. But of course I had to do all this strictly according to the ways of the Ishimoto family. I burned incense in the bronze burner and placed a few joss sticks in the pale green porcelain stand. Candles were burned inside the temple. Baya was a daughter of a retainer of the Tokugawa shogun and a living memorial of feudal days. She came to my husband's family as his nurse when he was a baby, and subsequently looked after his five brothers and a sister. Her wrinkled, smiling little face helped me to learn 
household customs, about which I sometimes hesitated to ask her mistress. On the afternoon of the day following my wedding, dressed in a purple semi-formal kimono bearing my own crest, I went to my father-in-law's grave and burned incense there, a visit to be repeated with flowers and incense by the bride at least five times a year. This was the first time <clears throat> I went out with my husband alone. Indeed, he still seemed to me a half-stranger. However, there was a little chance for us to talk to each other with no disturbance on this visit to the honorable grave. From the second to the fifth day after the wedding, my mother-in-law took the newly married couple to visit, relatives, and important friends of the family. This was an essential duty for a new wife to perform. It was not just a simple calling and a sipping of tea. It was a solemn calling accompanied by the giving of handsome presents. I had known something <clears throat> about this present exchanging business, as I had watched what my own mother used to do, but hereafter I was to perform this task as a means of helping my mother-in-law. Twice a year, in July, for the Bonn Festival, and at the year's end, we had to send gifts carefully chosen to meet the need and taste of each person among the relatives and household friends. Also, a happy coat with the family name and crest on it was presented to each of the artisans, carpenters, plasterers, mat makers, brick makers, and gardeners who had for many years been in the habit of working for the family. Rolls of kimono materials were given to the maids and to former maids who had left the household and married. Whenever a baby was born to any of the relatives, household workmen, or former servants, we sent clothes for the newborn, followed by gifts for the baby's first festival, the festival of the dolls, in the case of a girl, and of the sweet flags in the case of a boy. Still more important was the obligation to attend funerals. When somebody dies among the relatives or friends, a visit must take place immediately to speak words of grief and offer a present of condolence. Then one must go again to attend through night service and again for the funeral. After the funeral, there come the memorial services, the 10th, 20th, 30th, 40th, 50th, and 100th day service in the Shinto ritual. Besides the 7th, 14th, 21st, 28th, 35th, 49th, and 100th day service in the Buddhist ritual. Then, the anniversaries, the first, the third, the fifth, or the seventh year, to the tenth, or the thirteenth, seventeenth, or twentieth, to the fiftieth, and one hundredth year service, according to the family religion, should be observed, especially by the wife of the deceased, before the dutiful descendants are quite released from the centenary task of watching over the souls of departed ancestors. Westerners may understand why Japanese women do not take an interest in club life when they realize that these women of necessity see one another on these 
obligatory family occasions. This kind of household business keeps women of the upper class well occupied. I made a list of my husband's relatives and other people connected with the household, trying not to forget the details of their positions, so that I might make no blunder fatal to a Japanese wife in my performance of social obligations. The seventh day of my new life was the day for me to pay my first visit with my husband to my own family. My parents lived only three miles away, but I felt as if I had moved a hundred or a thousand miles. Freedom was not given the bride to visit her own people or even to telephone to them at will. How I longed to see my parents and all my beloved people again. My mind was filled with so many exciting impressions and new experiences which I longed to report, but the garment I was to wear had to be the first consideration. My mother-in-law presented me with a jade green kimono stamped with the five crest of the Ishimoto family for the visit. Its design was taken from the Utai music, the subject being Swahiro, which means glories until the end. Several fans dyed in different shades of beige were floating on a stream presented in Khan's water, fashion a classical touch. Custom calls for the bride to be dressed so in a new ceremonial kimono with her husband's crest to proclaim the fact that she has become a member of his family. My mother-in-law also gave me a gold ring with a big diamond saying, This is my personal present to my daughter-in-law. This jewel was given me by your late honorable father-in-law as a souvenir from his trip to Europe. I hope you will cherish this in memory of your parents-in-law and hand it down when you have a son to be married. Adorned with this brilliant ring and Swahiro fan kimono, I called upon my family. As water in a stone urn in the garden freezes on a cold winter day, but melts suddenly when spring sunshine comes back. So the thin ice which had covered up my timid heart by the freezing rigidity of my position in the new home dissolved easily at the sight of the warm familiar faces of those who impatiently awaited and welcomed me on my first visit home. Sisters and brothers clung to me and attacked me with a bombardment of talk. My mother said that she was pleased to know her daughter was behaving gracefully and nobly. Later, my mother told Uncle Yasuki that she thought a daughter was a vapor-like substance in the family, disappearing after long care and discipline leaving her mother with a sense of something lost forever. It would be disgraceful to confess, but I, the girl wife, felt more comfortable in the old nest with my parents than in the exalted post of baroness, and I had to be fairly pushed into the rickshaw, which was to carry me off. Appreciating the strain of learning so many new duties so quickly, my mother-in-law sent us to spend the New Year holidays in the country. Thus, I counted several days of a honeymoon among my bridal experiences in the old family system. We went into the quiet Hakon Mountains and enjoyed bathing in the hot spring. This was my first chance to talk intimately with my husband and to rest Though he looked young, Baron Ishimoto was ten years older than I and had a wide knowledge of both East and West. 
he had written his graduation thesis in English and in German. He read the Chinese classics as easily as his own language, so he would have to be very patient to educate his child wife to his level in such matters. He talked to me about his interest in social problems and his humanistic ideals. The theme of this conversation was hard for me to comprehend thoroughly, but I never tired of listening to him. We were quite happy together.